Good morning, everyone. Good morning. We welcome our friends and family uh, near and far. We love you and we miss you. Morning, church. We hope you guys are well. Um, missing you all lots. I um, hope you're feeling encouraged, managing to stay in the word. Uh, we're praying for you. hope you are richly blessed this morning. See you all soon. Bye. Bye. Good morning. So good to have you at our service this morning. We pray that God blesses you richly as uh, we worship God together and we hear God's words. We love you. God bless you. Goodbye. Good morning, good morning everybody. Everyone. Our God is a God who strengthens and encourages us. We miss you. We're praying for you. And we love you. Good morning. good morning. Thanks for tuning in this morning. So good that we can be all together like this. Yeah, we really miss being together with you all. Um, and we're praying for a safe and speedy end to this time so that we can worship and fellowship together in person okay. once again. Until then, keep close to God through prayer and scripture yeah. and be blessed. Yeah, amen. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be with you. Good morning everyone, welcome to New Life Church Biggin Hill. It's lovely to be meeting with you again this morning. I'm going to start by reading a psalm to um, just encourage us as we come to worship God. It is, oh this is Psalm 92. It is good to praise the Lord and make music to your name, O Most High, proclaiming your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night. To the music of the ten-stringed lyre, and the melody of the harp. For you make me glad by your deeds, Lord. I sing for joy at what your hands have done. How great are your works, Lord. How profound your thoughts. Let's come and worship him. Now, Gareth's going to lead us. Great. So, uh, if you can, try and stand if you can. Just uh, let's try and engage with, with worship as best we can, shall we? Let's rejoice. I want to scream it out from every mountain top. Your goodness knows no bounds. Your goodness never stops. Your mercy follows me. Your kindness fills my life. Your love amazes me. And I sing. Because you are good and I'll dance Because you are good and i shout Because you are good, you are good to me, to me And i sing because you are good and I'll dance Because you are good and i shout Because you are good, you are good to me, yeah Nothing and no one comes Nothing and no one comes Anywhere close to you The earth and oceans do Only reflect this truth And in my darkest night You shine as bright as day Your love amazes me And I sing because you are good And I'll dance because you are good and I shout because you are good, you are good to me, to me and I sing because you are good and I'll dance because you are good and I shout because you are good, you are good to me. With a cry of praise, my heart will proclaim you are good, you are good. In the sun and rain, my life celebrates You are good, you are good And I sing because you are good And I dance because you are good And I shout because you are good You are good to me, to me And I sing because you are good And I dance because you are good And I shout because you are good, you are good to me, yeah. Hallelujah, Lord. Oh, 
we praise you, Lord. We bless you. We thank you. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your grace to us. Lord, we want to celebrate today the abundance of your grace. Lord, as uh, Simon comes to speak to us now, we pray. Speak to us. Speak to our hearts, we pray. Oh, God, and uh, anoint us with ears to hear what you're saying. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning and great to be together again in this way. If this is the first time you found us or joined us online, it's great to have you with us. We also love seeing familiar faces and names in the comments section too, so please do say hi. Now we've been spending the last few weeks looking at the book or letter in the Bible called Philippians. It's a letter written by the Apostle Paul to a real church in Philippi. Now this guy Paul, he went through a dramatic transformation. He went from a hater and persecutor of Christians and the church to being a pioneer in God's kingdom. He encounters Jesus in the most unexpected way. He's on a road to a place called Damascus, where he's gonna continue his mission to eradicate the early church and put to death Christians, when suddenly the resurrected Jesus appears to him and stops him in his tracks. Now, long story short, Jesus gets hold of Paul, and Paul's response is to put his faith in Jesus and his life mission goes through a complete U-turn from seeking to destroy the early church. He literally gives his life to seeing it advance and grow. He plants and strengthens churches all over. And much of the New Testament is a record of some of the letters that he wrote to different churches, teaching, encouraging and shaping them. So this letter that we're looking at to the Philippians was written quite late in his ministry. He's already had 27, of ministry, uh, 27 years of ministry under his belt. He's written to the Galatians and the Thessalonians, the Corinthians and the Romans. He's done three missionary journeys. He's been shipwrecked and persecuted and imprisoned for his faith. And at the time of writing this letter, he finds himself in prison in Rome for the first time. This guy has done outstanding things in the kingdom of God. He's accomplished so much through his life, things that many of us only dream of doing. And yet he writes in this passage that we're looking at today, Philippians 3, starting in verse 12. Not that I've already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what's behind and straining towards what's ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us then, who are mature, should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already obtained. You see, in spite of all that Paul has already achieved in his life, he is not ready to quit. He's not ready to sit back and admire his life's work. He's got a sober awareness of his own maturity and faith. I've not arrived at my goal, he says. I still need to take hold of all that Jesus took hold of me to do. I'm still pressing on. Now, if you've spent much time in the Bible, you'll recognise that there are some bits which we find easy to relate to or understand because of our own lives. You know, when we read about widows or orphans or adoption, some of us can relate to the emotions which go with that. When we read about sickness or mourning or suffering, our hearts cry out, tell me about it. When fishing or farming or gardening or military life is talked about, we're reminded of hobbies or jobs or stories. It's one of the reasons that Jesus so often spoke in parables, because they're relatable and we can gain insights into heavenly truths through familiar imagery. This passage is one of those for me. Some of you will know that one of the things I love to do in my spare time is to run. I'm a proud member of Big In Runways whoop, whoop, and can often be found wearing a day glow top with a bright red face. Paul is using something which for many of us, even if we wouldn't class ourselves as runners or joggers, we can relate to some of what he's wanting to communicate through the imagery of straining ahead. We can conjure up a mental image of an athlete straining forward to win a prize. Now there are several times in the New Testament that the Christian life is pictured as a race. In 1 Corinthians 9 uh, verses 24 to 27 it says, do you not know that in a race all runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. And then in 2 Timothy 4, it says, 
I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And Hebrews 12 uh, verse 1 says, Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance, the race marked out for us. Now, I realise that my next statement may result in some backlash, maybe even a bit of online trolling, but at no point in the Christian life is it ever pictured as a golf course. Now, I realise with one small statement, I've just successfully offended some of my closest friends. But if you want to understand more about what living a life for Jesus looks like, then put down the golf clubs. And my encouragement to you is to start running. Because obviously what the Apostle Paul is doing here is drawing an analogy to help us understand something of the journey he's on and to encourage us in our own journeys of faith. What I want to do this morning is ask three simple questions of all of us, whether you've been a follower of Jesus for decades or whether this is your first time hearing someone talk about the Bible and Jesus. And the three questions are these. Are you running? Why are you running? And how are you running? So are you running? Keep going. Um, this question is to encourage us to think about what we're doing with our lives right now. I know lots of really, really good people who are trying to run a really good race in their lives, but in truth, they've never entered into the race. Last week, Gareth highlighted what the goal of Christian life looks like for the believer, to know Jesus Christ and to be like him to make knowledge of him our goal and that knowing him is infinitely more valuable than anything else that this world has to offer. Before encountering Jesus, Paul was doing everything that he could to be good, to follow the law, living a good life. But in truth, he was running a pointless race, a race with no prizes, no real goal, no real purpose. What's the point or the purpose of this life? If you've never really asked yourself that question, then I want to encourage you to engage with the Alpha Course. It asks the question, what is life really all about? Here's a plot spoiler for you. Being good, being kind, doesn't cut it. Being a Christian is so much more than trying to be good. The very heart of Christianity is recognising that none of us are good enough. So God sent his son Jesus to be good in our place. And it doesn't matter how well you think you're running in this life. If you don't know Jesus... You're in a race without a price. And for those of us who do know Jesus, the question still remains, are you running? Christian faith is not a one-off transaction. Sure, salvation is. In that moment when you put your faith in Jesus and repent of your sin, that's it. You're forgiven. You're adopted. All your shame and insecurities are covered by Jesus. It's done, but it's not the end. Just as the wedding day is not the sum total of what married life looks like, neither is the day you got saved the sum total of what your new life in Jesus looks like. There's an ongoingness in your faith which requires working out. There's a race to run, a journey to take. I often say to Fee, my wife, that I love her more now than I ever have. And it's true because we continue to get to know each other. And just when I think I've got her worked out, there's new revelations, new things to discover. And that happens as we intentionally go towards each other, as we intentionally look to discover more about each other. And we've been married for 18 years and we've not finished getting to know each other yet. And Paul is saying that even after all that he's done in his life, there's still so much more to learn and to know about God that he wants to continue to be in the race, to strain, to press on, to grow as a Christian. You've got to be in the race. But the next question to ask yourself is, why are you running? Now, before we go any further, it's key for us to know and be reminded of this, because otherwise this could sound like a must try harder sermon, which basically puts the emphasis on our ability to get ourselves saved, as opposed to the fact that it's all about what Jesus has done and not what you do. So it's so important to recognise that the challenge to press on to strive is not to somehow earn your salvation or gain God's love for us. Paul is not abandoning justification by faith, that basically our faith is all that we need, uh, that, that basically our faith is all that's needed for us to receive forgiveness and restoration to God. And he's not denying that salvation is free. In fact, it's because of those things, because of what Jesus has done, the finished work of the cross, sin defeated, forgiveness, that Paul is saying, come on, Jesus gave all, he's all for us 
Let us give our all for him. It's true of Paul and it's true of each of us who have put our faith in Jesus, that Christ Jesus took hold of us. For Paul, it happened on the road to Damascus, and now he presses on to hold to the reason that Jesus took hold of him. Believer, the reason you are in the race is because Jesus has grabbed hold of you and has said, I want you to run for me and with me. He got hold of you for purpose. And some of you need to be reminded of that today. The kingdom of God is advancing and we all get to play our part in that. But to ask the question, why are we running, is important. Now, what's our purpose in running? Like I said a moment ago, if you don't know Jesus, I want to encourage you to genuinely ask that question of yourself. But for, but for those of us who would say we're part of the God squad, we still need to ask ourselves, why am I running? What's my motivation? What's my goal? What's my purpose? And if you're not sure, ask yourself this question. What do I spend most of my time, most of my money, most of my energy on? Because that's normally a good indicator as to what you're living for, what you're running for. But what Paul is trying to encourage us to think about is the goal, the prize at the end of the race. The award ceremony takes place after the race, doesn't it? Right now, we're in the race. And during this race, we're encouraged by Jesus in Matthew 6, verse 19 to 21. Don't store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy it and where thieves can break in and steal it. But store up for yourselves treasure in heaven where moth and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, we don't talk about this stuff very often, but it is biblical and it's OK to have godly ambition. I often see it in my kids. They, they do things because they want to please me, not because they're trying to earn my love. They know that they already have it, but they want to demonstrate their love. One of the mysteries of God is what is this price? What does this reward really look like? Do you know, sometimes a thing is all the more impressive for being left undescribed. Paul doesn't tell us what the goal is, nor what the prize will be. But as you read and catch his passion for this goal, this prize, it raises something in our hearts, which feels worth pursuing, doesn't it? That this earthly life with all of its striving, sufferings and sacrifices will pale into insignificance with heavenly glory. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9 says, what no eye has seen and what no ear has heard and what no human mind has conceived the things of God that he's prepared for those who love him. That, my friends, is the goal and the prize. But how are you running? Are you putting in the effort? So five quick points I want to highlight as we think about how we run this race. OK, so firstly, this is a marathon, not a sprint. This is a lifelong run. So we need to approach it as such. There's a very different mindset needed to run 100 metres in two minutes to running an ultra marathon over 24 hours. And you also just don't turn up at the start line of a marathon. There's preparation. Any runner will tell you that there are good days and bad days. There are days when you feel like you're running well and there are days where you struggle to run a bath. But don't panic. It's a lifelong race. Secondly, you've got to get kitted out well. Wearing the right shoes, making sure that you're hydrated and ensuring there's fuel in your tank are all vital ingredients for the long race. I'm sure I'm not the only one guilty of using the phrase, let go and let God. And at its heart, what we're trying to communicate is our, you know, to stop trying to work it all out on your own and allow God to help. But we run the risk of interpreting it as, ah, it's not my problem, not my responsibility. It's all down to God to do whatever. And I'm just along for the ride. The thing is, that if that was how we're to live, then Paul would have said something like, I sit on the sidelines and I let ha life happen to me and around me. But... He didn't say that, did he? He said, I press on. I forget what's behind and I strain towards what's ahead. I want to win the prize. And that means ensuring that I'm equipping myself well for the journey. And the wonderful promise of scripture is that Jesus, through his divine power, has already given us all that we need for this life. Our responsibility is whether we want to use it or not. He's given us of himself, the Holy Spirit. He's provided us with the Bible, the word of God and his desire is that we would be in community together as the church, all parts of the equipment to run a good race. But it's also worth noting that the best runners only carry with them 
that which is essential for them to run a good race. Hebrews 12 verse 1 that I mentioned earlier on says, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. One of the key obstacles for us which can hinder our race is sin. All that we think, say and do which is against God. It stops us from pressing on, from taking hold, from straining forward to what is ahead. It's why the call to repentance should never become over familiar for us. We need to keep coming back towards the grace and mercy of Jesus, throwing off the junk which holds us back. I've heard it said that the devil knows your name and calls you by your sin. And God knows your sin, but he calls you by your name. Do you know what sin does? It shouts loudly from our past. And one of the enemy's best tactics is distraction. If he can get you distracted, then you stop pressing on. You stop striving. But the good news is that Jesus died so that your sin can be forgiven. Past, present and future. If you're in Christ Jesus, then you're no longer a slave to sin. You no longer need to be held back by it. It's been dealt with. Believer, do not let sin hold you back from being who God has called you to be. Thirdly, groups are better. Anyone in big and runways will tell you that there is a lot more enjoyment and more motivation when you run in a group. We're all created for community. You don't have to run this race on your own. Church is so much more than a Sunday morning worship meeting. Get connected, get some running buddies. And if you don't know how to do that, drop us a message and we'll let you know. Fourthly, keep looking forward. Paul says, doesn't he? Forget what's behind and strain towards what's ahead. Our lives to this point are made up of history. The good, the bad and the ugly. I believe Paul's encouragement is don't dwell on any of it. Sure, you may have had some incredible times in the past and that's great. Now press forward. Those horrific things that happened to you in the past, don't let them rob you of your future. Press forward. It's the dwelling on the past that can hinder our present effort and our future progress. Look at Paul. What's behind him at this moment? The shame and the regret of persecuting God's church and the joy and the fulfilment of building God's church. As with all of us, there's good and there's bad in our past, but Paul's saying that the one thing he does, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, he presses on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called him heavenward in Christ Jesus. And finally, run your own race. Don't be overcritical or bothered by how others are running. Paul is very self-aware in this passage. Notice how often he talks about himself. Not that I have already obtained this, but I press on. I don't consider I've made it. I strain forward. Man, too many of us are quick to look at others, their weaknesses, their failures. What we're doing is we're running, looking to the side. And that's not going to end well for us. Yes, run in a group. Yes, encourage one another. Yes, share running tips. But don't get so distracted with how others are running that you forget to look where you're going because you'll probably hit a tree. That's why I want to encourage us this morning to lay hold of what God wants to do in us as individuals and as a church. That we may press on and take hold of that for which Christ has taken hold of us. That forgetting what's behind and straining towards what's ahead, we'll press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called each of us heavenward in Christ Jesus. We believe that God's word is alive and active. And that as I've been sharing this morning, that he's been speaking to you. And what we want to do is to make sure that we can help you. And help each other to respond to what's doing. So at the end of this meeting, we're going to be opening up a Zoom room for anyone who would like prayer or would like to discuss anything that's come out of this morning. Please make the most of this opportunity. A link will appear in the comments section from Ben as the countdown at the end of the service begins. But as for now, thank you so much for joining me. And I'm going to hand us over to Tracy, who I've asked to pray for us. Thanks, sir, for that wonderful message this morning. Let's pray together. Oh, Father, we do thank you for the truths that are found in your word. Lord, we thank you for the great witnesses that have gone before us. 
Our Father, we do come before you this morning and ask that you would lead each one of your people on into the fullness of maturity. Lord, help us to be good stewards of all that you've given us and to spend time with you each day. Lord, it's, it's in you and you alone that we find the fulfillment of our lives and great purpose. Lord, will you bless each one that's listening to these words this morning and help us to grow in you. In your wonderful name, Lord Jesus, I do pray. Thank you. Lord, I come to you. Lord, I come to you. Let my heart be changed. Renew, flowing from the grace that I found in you. Lord, I've come to know the weaknesses I see in me will be stripped away by the power of your love. of your love as you live in me. Lord, renew my mind. Lord, renew my mind as your will unfolds in my life living every day. the power of your love
surround us every day, Lord God, so close to us, Lord. Oh, keep drawing us close, Lord. Draw us close, oh God. Oh, let your love surround us, Lord God. Help us to come near to you now. Help us to draw close, Lord. Oh, bring us near, Lord. Draw me to your side. And as I wait, I rise up like the eagle, and I will soar with you. Your spirit leads me on in the power of your love. Come, Holy Spirit, we pray. Come and lead us on, God. Lead us on as we worship you. Help us, oh God, we pray to draw very close to you. Come now, Spirit of God, in each home we pray. Come, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you, Lord. We bless you, Jesus.
are my God, you are my Savior, you are the rock on which I stand, ever faithful God, I cling to you in every way you show that you are good and there's no other love compares with you forever strong forever true ever faithful God I cling to you in every way you show I stand You are my God You are my Savior Eternal One The great I am And the faithful God I cling to you In every way you show That you are good the love compared with you forever strong forever true ever faithful I claim to you in every way you show that you you are good there's no other love We don't want to cling to anything else or anyone else. We want to cling to you. Oh, you're so faithful, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Faithful to all your promises. All your promises are yes and amen. Thank you, Lord. Bless you. Thank you. Bless you, Lord. Amen. God is good. All the time. And all the time. And so uh, we'll sing because he is good. And uh, that's how we came in. Uh, we're going to leave the feed open for another 10 minutes, but we're doing something different. Simon's already mentioned it. We're opening up a Zoom room, so if you want to respond or if you want to talk or there's something that you want to uh, just just uh, share with us uh, or want prayer or something like that, a Zoom room a link will open up and uh, you can see how to get to that. So God bless you. Uh, it's been good to be together again as best we can on a Sunday. We're looking forward to that time when we can all be together again. So let's, uh, let's keep our hearts good Let's keep our praise high as, and keep our faith high as, uh, as we go through another week. God bless you and see you uh, at 10 at 10 tomorrow. Thank you for joining us. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.